Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Allison Garcia. I'm a labor representative with the Mass Nurses Association, and I represent the Berkshire VNA clinicians. Um, really, we're excited to welcome you to our first community forum. I'm just going to talk about a few uh, boring housekeeping items first, which is that it looks like everybody's muted, which is great. We're going to um, stay muted during the forum just so there's no background noise for the speakers. Um, and the other item is we're going to have question and answers. Okay, um, I got, I see Allison. Okay, bye. <laughs> oh, hi, Eileen. Hi. Oh, I've got a big blank spot. Bye. <laughs> Welcome. I'm glad you you made, were able to make it on. I, I just think thought, so. Okay, I could get rid of that. No, I don't want to leave meeting. No, if you look at the bottom left hand of your screen, uh huh. See, stop. You can see a video or a mute. I'm just gonna help Elaine really quick. Hold on one sec, guys. Um, and if you want to turn your video on, you can. It might have um a red. I, I, yeah, all I see is a video camera. <laughs> and yeah, it, does it have a camera. does it have a red line through it? No. Oh, try clicking it anyway. I did. It's this. It's this right. not it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. How did you get out of that? Well, can you hear thing? me? Oh. As long as you can hear us and we can, I can hear you. you. Okay. So we just have folks uh, all hopping on, and I'm just getting started now. There's um, okay. a bunch of people on. So, if okay, I'm going to mute you just so we don't have background noise during the forum. But I know that at one point you're going to be speaking. So at that point, um, we'll, we'll unmute you for you uh, just to make it a little easier. Um, so at the end of the forum, we're actually going to have a question and answer. So I wanted to recommend that folks have pencil or paper nearby to jot down a question that you might that might come up for you um, and um, and who you want to direct your question to. Uh, so that way we're going to get all the questions done uh, at the end of the forum and not in the middle. Um, so with that, I'm just uh, happy to welcome you to our, our first community forum. And welcome all community members, uh, legislators, local elected officials. I wanna invite you all to, um, if you see at the bottom of your screen, there's something that looks like a little talking bubble and it says chat underneath. If you click on that, um, I welcome you to um, write your name and your political or community affiliation, or where you're from in the chat. Just give a minute just to do that right now, please. That would be great. Hi, Kelly. We've got some home care workers, lots of Berkshire DNA clinicians here tonight, some nurses, Julie Pinkham, the m &A executive director, Katie Murphy, president of the Massachusetts Nurses Association, someone from UFCW. Lots of folks. Thank you for putting that in. Continue to do that. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move on uh, and welcome our moderator for the evening, uh, Senator Paul Mark. As many of you know, represents Berkshire, Hamden, Franklin, and Hampshire County. Uh, he is consistently shown up for healthcare workers over the years, and we are so happy to have him here, moderating for us tonight. Welcome, Paul Mark. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Paul Mark. I'm the state senator for the Berkshire, Hamden, Franklin, and Hampshire district, which is 57 cities and towns throughout Western Massachusetts. So I have all 32 communities in the Berkshires, 11 in Franklin County, nine in Hampshire County, and also five in Hamden County. So the largest legislative district in the history of the state uh, that I have the joy of driving across on a regular basis. And I apologize for being in the car as I make my way back slowly from uh, Boston. There was, of course, traffic, which is become even more unpredictable now that we're returning to some sense of no normalcy after the uh, pandemic. Uh, but I'm honored to be here tonight and to be part of this. For people that don't know me, maybe 
Uh, I've been a union member since I was 16 years old, and I remain today an active dues-paying member of both the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and the Massachusetts Teachers Association. And so when I hear concerns about what's going on in a community, when I hear that there's people in a workforce that are looking to organize, looking to get involved in a union, uh, looking to be part of that movement to have democracy in their workplace and fight for better wages and fight for better working conditions. You know, I, I, I get thrilled to be asked to be a part of it in any capacity. So it's really great to be able to be here and act as a ceremonial moderator, as it were, from the car. And my first uh, duty tonight, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing quickly Ian from the Western Massachusetts Area Labor Federation, which is an amalgamation, cooperative amalgamation of the local labor councils from uh, all four Western Massachusetts counties. And Ian uh, and the Western Mass Elf are, are co-sponsors, and uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to him quickly. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Mark. Um, as, as Paul mentioned, my name is Ian Rodewalt. I'm the field organizer for the Western Mass Area Labor Federation. Uh, we are a coalition. Uh, well, we're first of all, we're, we're thrilled to be co-sponsoring this forum this evening. Um, we are a coalition made up of more than 60 public and private sector unions in the four westernmost counties of the state, uh, dedicated to building power and, and a better world for the working class. We represent and fight for the interests of 50,000 unionized workers in the region in all different sectors. As the pandemic started, we saw and heard the rhetoric of essential workers. We know that nurses and healthcare workers are essential workers, but despite th that rhetoric, uh, are not treated by management with the res respect, dignity, workplace safety, and adequate wages that essential workers deserve. I come to the labor movement as a former educator, a longtime preschool teacher specifically. Teachers unions use the phrase, teachers working conditions are students learning conditions. To modify that phrase a bit for this evening's context, healthcare workers, condition, healthcare workers working conditions are patients' healing conditions. These conditions are vital to patients, to families, to communities, to workers, to unions, to the labor movement. The Western Mass Area Labor Federation stands with the Berkshire VNA clinicians in the fight for better working conditions and creating better healing conditions for patients. We look forward to learning more this evening about the future of home care and how we can best support you. Thank you for all the important work that you do. Your fight and struggle is our fight and struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you for that message from the Western Mass Elf. Uh, extremely important that regardless of the sector, that union members and, and workers throughout the area work together in cooperation and collaboration to make sure that, that, that we're all getting our fair shake, that we're all having our, our voices heard. So I, I appreciate that. And I, I thank you for taking the time, Ian. And uh, now it's my my pleasure to introduce Nicole Roach, who is the uh, strategic researchers, researcher for the Mass Nurses Association, and she's going to give a, a quick presentation. Uh, or don't don't rush because I said that she's going to give <laughs> a, an informative presentation on the state of home care uh, in in the region. So thank you, Nicole. Thanks, Paul. Now I'm going to do it in double time, so this might get <laughs> exciting. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to share screen, and please just let me know if you're not seeing. Um, all right. How's that? If anybody wants to let me, uh, you know what? I can't see any people. So I'll just assume it's it's going well and everybody <clears throat> can see this. So, all right. Uh, it's like my first Zoom, but it's my five millionth Zoom. So my uh, my goal tonight is to just spend a few minutes talking about the home healthcare field and uh, the impacts that insufficient staffing and poor management are having on um, patient care, specifically at Berkshire Visiting Nurses Association or BVNA, which is owned and operated by Berkshire Health Systems. Um, and I, th oh, okay. And I thought, let's see. Hold on a second, guys. Something funny is happening. Um, okay, can you see this now? <laughs> okay, so I thought we'd just sort of start at the beginning um, with the history of 
home care. I won't give it all to you, but um, in the early 19th century in the United States, um, the wealthy started hiring their own physicians and nurses to care for them at home because hospitals didn't have the capacity to care for chronically ill patients over a very long period of time. So the wealthy who could afford to started doing that in their homes. Nonprofit organizations uh, developed out of a need to provide the similar that similar level of care to patients and to the chronically ill poor in their homes. And they actually found that the care was more cost effective when delivered at home. And th the difference between the patients we're seeing in the or we saw in the 18th and 19th hundreds who were receiving care at home and the patients today is dramatic. Um, the types of patients accessing home care are no longer just the elderly and the chronically ill. Um, they are patients who are acutely ill. Patients today arrive home um, and in need of home care services in their homes after being discharged from the hospital, much more acutely ill than they were in years past. And there are a couple of factors for that. The first, and I think um, you know, this will be something you've heard about before, but the most uh, important factor, I'd say, is the, the fact that so many registered nurses are assigned too many patients to care for. And what the data suggests is that when a nurse has too many patients to care for, she cannot do the education and preparation that a patient needs to go home and be able to either care for themselves or to um, prepare for and commit to home care visits. So there's the, the education piece that nurses just simply often don't have time to do um, when there are just so many patients vying for their attention. And the second thing is that hospitals really have a financial incentive to get patients out of the hospital as quickly as possible. So in the past, a patient might have um, stayed in the hospital for a few days after surgery. Today, it's not uncommon for if you even stay overnight, after surgery, you're you're going home on you know day two, and so these patients are in um, need of much more significant and complex health care. And today, patients who are um, receiving home health care, like from the clinicians at BVNA, are patients who have had surgery and need wound care or medication management and adjustment. There are patients who have had, uh, had a stroke and need physical therapy and occupational therapy, patients who have had mastectomies or babies or knee replacements or heart attacks, just patients kind of from very young to very old and at every stage of life in between. And home care, um, like nursing care in a hospital, requires so much additional paperwork and documentation that nurses and other clinicians are often pulled away from the bedside from delivering the care to patients to, to complete all of those documentation requirements. And many home care or organizations like BVNA does not, they don't schedule um, clinicians appropriately to allow for the full spectrum of care and, um, and documentation. And so I also want to look at um, a few factors that contribute to the quality and efficacy of home care that patients receive. Last year, the Journal of American Medical Directors Association published a study which found significant connections between the timeliness of a first home care visit. So when you're discharged from the hospital, from that point to the time your clinician arrives at your home to do an intake and to begin to give you care that's really connected to how well a patient does and, um, and what their health outcomes are. And so this study found that about a third of home care patients don't get their initial visit within 48 hours of hospital discharge. And 48 hours does not sound like a long time, but when a patient is so much more ill and um, in acute need than they would have been in the past, those 48 hours matter a lot. And it's important that their care starts as quickly as possible. The study found that administrative or scheduling issues caused upwards of 18% of start of care um, visit delays. And of the people who experienced delays in their care, 14% of them were re-hospitalized or ended up in the emergency room within 30 days of their discharge. So now we know that patients are sicker and that the care that clinicians are providing to them in their homes is more complex than it would have been in the past. How does this apply to the Berkshires? Well, I probably don't have to tell 
anyone in this meeting that Berkshire County is almost 1,000 square miles and includes 32 cities and towns, all of which uh, are part of BVNA's service area. And clinicians are expected to um, care for patients all over Berkshire County and required to drive long hours in um, many hours, long distances, in all kinds of weather conditions. They complete hours of intake paperwork and ongoing documentation for each patient they have. And that's all on top of the patient care that they're really committed to providing. Management who doesn't work in the field or who, who maybe you know, they've never worked in the field or hasn't, haven't done so in a really long time, are creating these schedules that um, are assigning clinicians too many patients in a day and not enough time to, to see and adequately care for those patients. And there's a staffing crisis at BVNA, which we'll get to. And some patients uh, in Berkshire County are actually refused care by v BVNA because they don't have the staffing to provide care for all of the patients in the communities in the area who need it. So what's causing this staffing crisis? During COVID, I'm sure many of you heard that um, there is a national shortage of nurses. That's not the case, especially here in Massachusetts. If you look at this chart, which is from the Board of Registration of Nurses, between 2019 and 2022, the number of nurses who graduated from nursing school ready to um, start a new job in the field rose by 24%. So there is no shortage of nurses or other clinicians in Massachusetts. So what's the cause at BVNA? Uh, we've already talked about some of the work, working conditions and I'm really going through them really quickly. I think the clinicians who are here tonight, Tamron and Sean and anybody else will really be able to share their experiences on the ground, but just from the global research uh, experience, I can say that, um, you know, we've talked a few about uh, the work conditions a little bit, but another really important factor is the low wages at BVNA. So, um, the average wage at Berkshire Visiting Nurse Association is below what healthcare professionals are making at every other MA facility in Western and Central Massachusetts. Even an RN or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist who has 25 to 30 years of service at BN BVNA, um, so may have worked there their entire career, their pay is still um, below what their counterparts are making at Berkshire Medical Center or in other facilities just a few years out of their undergraduate or graduate programs. So their wages are simply, um, you know, not market appropriate and are not competitive in any way. And the combination of chaotic scheduling, too many patients, too few staff, and these dramatically lower wages when compared to competitors makes BVNA a place that many people don't want to work at or don't want to stay. So the question is, can Berkshire health systems afford to do better at BVNA? And if so, what's standing in the way? The answer to the first question is yes, absolutely. Berkshire health systems can afford to do better at BVNA. Just between 2017 and 2021, um, BHS made $245 million in profit. Uh, that's a lot of money and it's plenty in um, a community that really is desperate for additional staffing and resources in community-based home health care. So maybe the issue is not the money, but the priorities. And what are Berkshire Health System's priorities? Well, we could probably spend all night talking about the things that BHS has been spending money on, but I want to point your attention to just two. The first is executive pay. Um, former CEO David Phelps, wa who retired in 2021, um, he made a combined $6 million between 2015 and 2021. Um, and looking at BVNA's budget, $6 million would go a long way in providing additional staff. He, uh, Berkshire Health Systems contributed an, addition, contributed an additional $1.72 million just to his life insurance uh, plan. He got a 20% raise in 2020, the first year of COVID, and the same year the Berkshire Health Systems was telling everybody, including probably Paul Mark, that they were going broke. Um, he made over a million dollars in 2021 alone. And his successor, Darlene Rodowitz, is on track to catch up really quickly between just 2019 and 2021. She saw an 18% increase in her pay, which is the equivalent, uh, equivalent of more than $100,000. Um, and it's not just executives that um, 
Berkshire Health Systems is spending money on, they're also saving quite a bit of money in the Cayman Islands. Um, in 2020, Berkshire Health had $14 million in assets in the Cayman Islands captive insurance company. Um, and if you're a normal person, you might not know a lot about the Cayman Islands, but it's a place where the rich and corporations tend to um, put their money so that there's zero government oversight or regulatory reporting requirements. So, um, you know, executive pay and captive dollars in the Cayman Islands are only a couple of um, Berkshire Health's financial priorities, but um, it's clear that Berkshire Health does have the financial capacity to provide high quality care to the patients of Berkshire County. And, um, and it's clear that BVNA patients and their clinicians deserve better. And that's it for me for now. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, for uh, not too quick and not too short uh, presentation. <laughs> I'm sure everybody was very happy with um, and very informative for for sure. Uh, next up, I'm going to introduce two actual on the ground clinicians uh, that are members of the Visiting Nurses Association. We have Tamarin and Sean, who are members of the Union Organizing Committee, which Having been involved in organizing uh, in the past, that is not a joke. That is a serious commitment, and it is something that is definitely worth uh, applauding. And uh, now I, I welcome the two of them to come on and 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 say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to start. Um, my name is Tamron uh, Tamron Claudis, and I'll just give you a little history about myself. Um, I graduated from West Virginia Westland um, with a Bachelor of Science, and that was in 1994. And then I went on to Springfield College and got my graduate degree from physical therapy in Springfield, Mass. in 97. And that's kind of what um, brought me this towards this area and starting to discover the Berkshires. Uh, after I graduated, I went on and uh, experienced PT in several different fields. I worked in pediatrics, spinal cord rehab. Um, subacute rehab, outpatients, a little bit of acute care, and eventually I uh, skilled nursing facilities and eventually found my way to home care. Um, and that's where I found my passion. And I have been here for 15 years. Uh, no, actually a little over 18 years um, doing physical therapy and home care. I had always known um, since I was about 15 years old, I'd be a physical therapist. I had no question in my mind. I was just a child who knew what I was gonna do. And despite my mom thinking I was gonna be a doctor and trying to push me in these different directions, I always came back to physical therapy and I've never regretted it. Something I didn't know I'd ever be doing is organizing a union and actually being a co-chair of a union. <laughs> so how did I get here? So when I initially started working um, at the Berkshire VNA, I thought it was the greatest place to work. It was really awesome. I had great managers, great clinicians, nurses, um, knew that this would be the place I would retire. Uh, but then that started changing probably about eight years ago and really changing about five years ago. Um, home care has never been a consistent eight hour day. It's just part of the beast when you go into home care but it started becoming um, more like a 10 to 12 hour day on a regular basis with a huge amount of stress and responsibility. We saw our documentation increasing tremendously and we also saw the acuity of our patients increasing. Um, an example to give you is a total knee replacement. When I first started working in home care, a total knee replacement would always stay in the hospital for a few days and then transition to a subacute care or a skilled nursing facility for a couple of weeks and then come home and have a nursing admit them and then have PT go in and do the physical therapy. Today, they are doing same day discharges and physical therapists are doing the full admission. So we're doing um, wound assessments, we're doing staple removal, we're doing um, medication management, we're coordinating care across, um, these are medically complex patients. So we have to coordinate the care among their specialists. Um, and we haven't been given any more time to do this. We're not given any extra time for documentation and we are not given any extra time for the assessment. Um, and also Medicare with their whole Oasis assessment has increased their amount of documentation they want us to put in. Um, I think it's, uh, I read somewhere it's up to 320 time points that we have to answer for Medicare alone without all the additional stuff that we, our facility wants. Um, and again, we haven't, um, 
uh, I can't say it, six months ago after we unionized and started fighting, we did get an additional hour for one type of visit. But other than that, no extra time has been given to us. Um, so as this was started happening, I started seeing clinicians move, uh, filter out and more and more clinicians started leaving, leaving some of the best nurses I've ever worked with. I saw um, walk out the door. I started meeting with management because I was convinced that our managers just needed to understand what was going on and we could do it through committees, which we tried. Management was willing to do committees, uh, but our recommendations just fell in deaf ears. We saw no implementations of what we recommended um, and we had no strength to enforce them to come through on what they told us they would do. Um, more clinicians were leaving. I think I got up to like 13 or 14 and I stopped counting at that point. And I started to think maybe it was time for me to leave. And um, as I was contemplating it and I started talking to some of the people that were left, I realized there was another group of people that also were committed uh, and really loved home care and really wanted to see things change. We were getting concerned for ourselves, but also our community um, and the direction this was going. So uh, we decided to start seeing, um, entertaining the idea of organizing. And that occurred about three years ago. And so this has been a very long road and process um, we, it's been wonderful and, um, heart-wrenching and just, um, but we decided, we decided we're going to do this. We decided we're going to stay together, that we're going to fight, that we're going to fight for each other. And most importantly, that we're going to fight for our community to make sure that we can keep this patient center care, um, and make sure we can continue to provide this quality of care that's so desperately needed. Um, so I just really want to thank you, thank everybody who's come out to help support us with this fight um, so we can continue to do this. I'm going to turn it over to Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you all for coming on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Mattoon. I'm a registered nurse and a WOCN, a wound ostomy and continence certified specialist for the VNA. I received my associates from Berkshire Community College and my bachelor's from UMass Amherst. Uh, while I, like many other healthcare disciplines, have worked in a variety of settings, I really found my passion with home care. When I first entered nursing school, to be honest, I had no idea what a visiting nurse did. And I think that's kind of the general consensus with the community is you hear about visiting nurses and you think, okay, well, they do blood pressures, they might do some medications, but uh, they're not as involved as a hospital nurse. And I had no idea that scattered throughout Berkshire County was this amazingly spirited group of nurses, home health aides, social workers, physical, occupational, speech therapists, these people going from home to home to deliver a special type of care to those in need, you know, right where they are, not having them to go anywhere else. So I just want to take a moment to share with you what a typical day looks like through the eyes of a Berkshire VNA clinician so that you can understand not only what we do, but some of the challenges that we face along the way. So my typical day starts at about 7 a.m., which isn't quite you know, the time that I'm officially working, but I have to review charts. I have to see what my day is going to look like. I try to plan as much as I possibly can so that I can hit the ground running as quickly as possible. So at eight, I can officially start my day. I get my finalized schedule from uh, the scheduling office and I try to set up my assignments, which may still change and begin making some phone calls to my patients so that I can schedule a time that I can see them that fits in with not only my schedule, but theirs as well, while attempting to sort of optimize the travel time so that I'm not spent driving back and forth and making too many loops. My first visit could be as close as down the street or as far away as an hour to an hour and a half, depending upon the need of the day. Really, we span the entirety of Berkshire County sometimes, so it seems like we're doing more driving than not. <laughs> uh, routine home visits can consist of a wide variety of skill from uh, cardiopulmonary assessment to where we're taking vital signs, listening to lung sounds, trying to catch anything that may happen before it happens to advanced neurological assessments, complex wound care with tubes and drains and vacuums and blood work in between all of this, really trying to maintain a good picture of health in the home as best we can. Every piece of a visit must be well-documented to ensure patient safety and good continuity between myself and the next clinician that may see the client. 
I try to obtain my own consistency with my clients as much as possible, but sometimes it just doesn't work that way. So we need to have a really strong paper trail with really strong documentation. Uh, as I drive in between my visits and every subsequent visit, I'm mentally trying to case manage, planning my clients' visits ahead while taking the time to make and receive phone calls required to and from doctor's offices, the BVNA office, trying to address family and client concerns. And we repeat this whole process about six to seven times a day, depending upon the needs of the community that day. I typically see my last client around 3 to 3.30, finishing all of my visits at about 4.30. At that point, my day is technically done, but then I still have charting to do. I've got case management and follow-up to do, emails to send out to other clinicians or the staff at the VNA office so that we can prepare for the next day. Eventually, once that is done, I spend time with my family to begin the process the next day. <laughs> so... While this may sound a lot like I regret the work that I do, I just want to be clear that I absolutely do not. I love being a nurse and I love working with the VNA. I love working with the community to really put hands-on care directly where it's needed. I just want to say that, you know, we're here today to highlight the struggles that we face day to day to make the community more aware of the struggles that we face and how we're trying to create a more sustainable future for not only our clinicians and ourselves, but the community that we serve. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Sean and Tamarin, for giving uh, a little uh, glimpse into your day-to-day -day, uh, activities. And, and we appreciate how hard you work. We appreciate that to do a job and to do it well under such circumstances indicates so much passion. And I'm sure you bring that passion and that care to every patient that you see. And so I uh, really appreciate taking a couple of minutes to just talk about what's going on in the community. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to Allison, who is going to take questions and answers. And once again, uh, I thank everybody for allowing me to have a, a chance to participate and be part of this. I, I really appreciate it. And I thank everyone that's uh, that's involved in, in in both participating, presenting, and and hearing about what's happening in this in this sector. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Rose Bookbinder. Allison just lost um, service, so I'm just stepping in for a moment. Um, I'm another labor AD at the MNA. Um, so actually, before we take questions, um, Elaine, who's a past patient, would like to speak to her experience. And Elaine, if you need me, let me, um, Joe, can you unmute Elaine? And I think Elaine, you'll have to say, like, accept the unmute. I accept the unmute. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. I think I'm still muted, though. Nope, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, well, my first my first experience with visiting nurses when when my mother needed um, I have echoes. <laughs> my mother needed help when she broke her pelvis and she broke her hip. Uh, she recovered lovely and she um, went on to be 97 and she did everything great. But I was more of an onlooker for her and for my husband when he had open heart surgery. But let me, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll read the letter I wrote because this was my own personal experience. So last summer, I had the unfortunate opportunity to be in need of nursing and therapy services. That necessity turned into such a positive experience for me, even through the stress of illness. The visiting nurses and physical therapists who came to assist me gave me much more than their job descriptions required. Besides being extremely professional and knowledgeable in the way they presented themselves, they brought a breath of fresh air into the house. While they were tending to me, I was completely secure in the fact of their knowing exactly what they were doing and what I needed, asking the right questions and listening to me. I always felt uplifted after their departure and was at ease with how my recovery was going. They are such an asset to your organization. Now that said, I feel very bad that I am never aware of the difficulties and the and and all the problems that the VNA is is uh is is a, is have is right now being being a part of their lives. Um, 
I just took it for granted. I took their, I took everything for granted, their expertise and everything without knowing what they were going through. Nobody really complained. They just did their work. So I, I hope that, you know, that you do get the, the funds you need, that you're well deserving of it. And, and I am so appreciative of everything that you do. Thank you so much, Elaine. Those are really powerful words and so important to be reminded um, of the impact that all of the clinicians have on our community. Um, I think Allison is back, but um, I think next up, I, I can't see her on here, um, is, um, are you here, Allison? Yes, I am. Oh, you want me to okay, okay, great. Do you wanna take it away now or? Yeah, I can take okay. it away. Sorry, okay. I lost. Um, internet on my laptop, can't get it back. I'm on my phone now. So um, I, I'm so sorry to have missed Elaine's comments, but I did get a chance to read her her email and uh, I'm very appreciative of her words in support of, of the clinicians. Um, at this point, we would like to open it up to question and answers. Um, I wanna invite folks to um, write their question in the chat and, um, and write who would you like to address your question to. Um, I I just won't be able to, I don't know that maybe I'll be um, able to see it. Sorry, okay. Allison, while you were off, actually we um we missed one part, which was we wanted to honor MA president um Katie Murphy to say a few words before we get to questions. Uh, sorry, you were off for yeah. that. <laughs> All right, yeah, absolutely well, Katie. Take it away. Hi, hi everybody. And actually um it's an honor to be here. Um, I, you know, I'm a, an inpatient nurse and when our patients leave the hospital, we are so concerned about them because like you're saying, they're leaving sicker, more complicated with greater needs. And our team providing home care is, we know is crucial to our patients and crucial to our communities. You know, we're all, we're all on one team, right? We really are. Our setting is just a little bit different. And, and I have monitors and IV poles and you have a couch and a refrigerator and, and maybe a, a dog licking your face, right? While you're doing your work. So um, I, I don't think it can even be overemphasized the amount of work you do in keeping people healthy in their communities and without a doubt, contributing to people living healthier and longer lives. So you know, all, all my applause to all of you. And I'm gonna, I look forward to listening to the questions and comments. Thank you so much, Katie. Appreciate, I appreciate you being here and I appreciate those comments. Um, so now we're gonna open it up for a question and answer. So I'd say, if you can put your, your question in the chat um, and, do, and uh, let us know who you're directing your question to. And if you can't, that's okay. Um, give us a wave and, or come off mute and let us know you have a question. I saw somebody wrote in the chat that they have a question that they were, they would need to come off mute for because they're driving. So I would say, let's start with your question. Hi, it's uh, Joe Dibber. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great, a great presentation, well done. Um, and my question is through three different lenses. One as a patient or a caregiver, uh, where the VNA provided excellent care to my wife when she was recovering from surgery. So that's one that was about seven years ago. Couldn't be better. Um, two, I used to be the CIO at, at Berkshire, so I understand what your struggles are um, are uh, addressing and uh, completely support um, moving those forward. Now I'm the CIO at Holyoke, uh, which leads to my other question is that when you look at the future of home care and where healthcare is going nationally, what are your thoughts on um, the what I see as the very valuable service of VNA to prevent readmissions, to help patients heal in their home, which is a much better place to heal uh, than being an inpatient? Um, and then um, you know, around the social terms of health, et cetera, um, where there may be additional things called upon a VNA to look at or to um, observe such as um, access to healthy uh, foods or transportation needs or things of that nature uh, for follow-up visits. But what, just general thoughts on kind of the futuristic part of the VNA. Um, I'm not sure who to direct that question to. 
but but definitely, I think the VNA plays a pivotal role in helping us reduce costs in, in healthcare in our local communities and, and nationally. Um, I can I can take a stab at it just from a research point of view. Although I think um, you know the nurses and clinicians in the room would probably do a better job. But uh, from everything I'm seeing, um, as the population ages, uh, we'll see more and more need for home health care uh, in the future. Additionally, you know, hospitals throughout Massachusetts, well, nationally, but especially in Massachusetts, we've seen all kinds of hospital closures and unit closures in the state over the past decade. So you'll see a hospital close a maternity unit um, and you know patients are forced to go elsewhere for their acute maternity needs. But sometimes those patients need care after their discharge from the hospital or their baby needs care. And so you'll see that uh, as closures impact communities and patients will also see, um, and as hospitals, uh, you know, spend more money kind of opening these outpatient centers, which are really kind of, you know, um, very good care can happen in an outpatient setting, of course, but they're really, uh, the goal is to really make money, to turn a profit, because if you can do something in a day surgery that doesn't require an overnight bed and the nursing and other clinicians staffing um, to take care of a patient, you'll a hospital might do that to save money. So aging population plus more plus less access to inpatient acute care, plus more um, hospital focus on uh, driving costs down to drive profits up. And I think you're going to see the need for home health care just continue to grow. And I would imagine at a faster pace. That's one part of the answer. Yeah, to this is Tamron to bridge off and Nicole. That that's exactly what's happening. Um, and the reimbursement. It's just it's it's both. It it really it, if you can get the skilled clinician in the home and get the support that they need and the time they need, it's a safer place for patients to be. Um, the risk of um, the word is escaping me, non-social, the, the infections you can get from picking up in the hospital, you don't necessarily have. So the sooner we can get a patient out of the hospital and they don't need that acute care, the better. Um, so transitioning in home as fast as possible. And then it's much cheaper in the home than it is um, in the hospital care. So they are looking, there's several different models out there proposed right now. Um, I think there's some agencies within the government that are looking at um, creative ideas that people may have on ways to start um, utilizing home care um, in better, more efficient ways. But no matter what, that all leads to that we need skilled clinicians. One of the things that we're running into with wages, and again, I have to, I told, honestly, I did not go into organizing over wages. I had no, it was about having time with my patient care, but I have discovered one of our true issues with maintaining staff and then get recruiting new staff is our wages are just too low because our managers who have experienced home care, it was like 20 years ago, that was a totally different type of home care. It is much more intense, it's much more skilled. You have to be able to stand on your feet and stand alone with very sick people. And you, you can't, in the hospital, you can specialize. If I went to schedule my patient um, who had a spinal cord injury at outpatients, and they had two therapists that were specialized in spinal cord injury, and none of the other therapists would see them. Uh, whereas in home, you, you have to be specialized in all of these. You have to be able to handle all these different injuries and have the skills and the experience. And we need to be able to re re recruit nurses and therapists have many years of experience so they can have the skill to deliver this acute care that's going to be definitely be transitioning in the home and should be. We should, we should be able to support this and encourage this because this is what needs to happen. Um, and there's no question, care is shifting away from nursing homes. Um, Medicare has drastically cut what they're reimbursing um, for rehab and therapy in the nursing home because it, it, they just wanna start transitioning to a home care model. Um, and there's a lot of different things already starting to happen I could go into, but I, I won't go into that, all of that, but yes, um, to your home care is the future. It's the fastest growing industry, I believe that in healthcare right now. And just to add quickly to what Tamron says, you know, anecdotally, we've already seen a lot of the acuity of people coming out of the hospital become much higher in home care, where post-operative patients that were, like Tamron said, held in the hospital for a few more days are now being discharged much more quickly to the benefit of having less infection risk, having better healing rates, mental health is also a great component of that, you know, being in your own, you know, healing milieu 
is a great component of home health. So we already are seeing a lot of these take effect. The trend line is just going to continue forward where the acuity is going to become more high in the home. And we're going to require more skilled clinicians to take care of that higher acuity. Great answers. Thank you so much. And so we have some questions in the chat, I believe. Um, to Sean and Tamron, can you let us know the current status of your negotiations? In, any, in addition, how can members of the community be helpful to you? <clears throat> Sean, do you, Sean, do you wanna take it? <laughs> so we've made some good headway in our negotiations. We have a lot of very important language in there that revolves around how our schedules are set up and protections for our per diem staff, which are integral for a lot of what we do. Um, the things that we're really getting caught up on that are very pivotal issues for us all revolve around our productivity language and our wages. And honestly, these two components are incredibly important to why we unionized productivity, especially where, you know, if you don't know what productivity is, it's kind of the the standard that we're held to day to day to see a certain amount of patients within a certain time frame and have a certain amount of work done. So as we see, you know, the higher acuities occur in the home, our productivity rating, which is set at uh, you know, around like five and a half to six is becoming more difficult to achieve. And as it becomes more difficult to achieve, we find that we're having to spend uh, more and more time with each patient that lowers our acuity rating so we really are trying to get management to agree on adjusting how much time we have with our patient to allow us to have more time to make the phone calls to the doctor's offices, to perform the care that we need to perform with these patients to have better patient outcomes and higher patient satisfaction. And in response to what you can do to help support us, I believe there's um, a link to this. I would need Joe or Allison to guide you on that. Um, yeah, we are gonna be talking a little bit about that in just a few minutes. I wanna add, like um, allow for a few more questions, but we definitely will be um, answering that question. So just hang on just a few more minutes. There's gonna be, if, unless Joe already dropped it in the chat. Yep, um, he, there's a link right in there right now in case you do have to, to get off before we finish the questions that um, you can click on the link and it will bring you to um, a letter that, well, first, the first page is for you to enter in your information, your name and, and contact information. And then it brings you to the second page is the pre-written letter that will, uh, that asks for the um, Berkshire Health System CEO to support the Berkshire VNA and their fight for safer patient home care conditions. Um, you can either send that over or you can write your own um, message and it will and it will send uh, it's a few easy steps and it will send over to the um, the uh, CEO of Berkshire Health Systems. Um, is that I'm sorry, I'm sorry uh, Zoom has a weird thing where it won't actually link. It won't create a live link in there. So you'll might have to copy and paste the link. Um, but we'll post that on our MA social media after this. Um, and we'll send follow-up emails to our email list. So that link will be out there um, if you're unable to grab it from the chat. And I'd just like to add in there too that um, there's also letters to the editors. That That's great. That would be really awesome if anybody has uh, inspiration and time to do that. And uh, we'll be posting next um, Tuesday. We're doing a standout in, um, I always call it the wrong place, Park Square in Pittsfield. Uh, so it's always open to the community. We would love, love to have community members come and join us um, to show their support. Um, and as we do those type of actions, we try to post the, that and get that out to the community. So always feel free to just stop in and join us. Um, and great. Um, I can answer the question about um the huge profit margin compensated. Uh, Jeff's question about how much of the profit margin would compensate the membership and increase staffing. Um, so that, that $245 million 
uh, number, that profit number that I mentioned earlier would certainly do the trick. But I think um, Tamron and Sean and the rest of the clinicians at BVNA have put a really reasonable wage proposal across the table to management. Management has so far refused to um, make any headway in this area. They don't want to have a wage scale. They want to continue to pay nurses and speech therapists and all the clinicians, whatever they want, whenever they want, in a way that doesn't honor experience or even service to BVNA. So, you know, you'll you'll have um, uh, clinicians who have been working for BVNA for decades who have barely seen a raise. And we all really believe that um, a fundamental component to an equitable workplace is having wages that reflect your expertise and experience. So I think um, the answer is management should accept the reasonable, um, more than reasonable wage scale proposal we have. And um, to Elaine's question on Berkshire Health Systems, awareness around their unfair distribution of finances. You know, they are, of course, that, um, you know, every time we have a conversation with management, whether it's the nurses or any other clinicians, um, we're talking to management about the fact that the focus has to be on patient care and the best way to provide patient care in a hospital or in the home is to make sure there are enough staff to do that care and enough highly trained, fairly compensated staff to do that. Uh, but a great way to remind Berkshire Health System uh, executives about um, how important that is, is for folks to, from the community who like Elaine have had really good experiences with the clinicians at BVNA to keep reaching out to leadership and to the public in any way that you can to kind of express your, your feelings about it. Thanks, Nicole. Um, there is, um... One more question. I don't think this is the one you answered. Um, so we, I, we do have time for just one more question. Uh, I think we could do that and then we'll, we can wrap it up. Uh, it says, if people are going home sooner and patients have more acute problems, why hasn't our healthcare system both locally and nationally redirected funds to address these needs? Well, I don't know who. Well, why aren't resources including reimbursement not increasing to infuse this sector with quality educated clinicians that will want to specialize in the growing field and want to stay in it. I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, so is the question why like Medicare is not giving more towards this area? Is that the question? I can't see it, so I uh, can't. So it's in the chat. Um, I, I can respond to some of that if you want. I think the question is about, um, but Tamron and Sean, you probably can do a better job. I think the question is asking why there aren't funds directed at home care in the same, why the reimbursement rates aren't as good in home care as they are in acute care settings. Um, and um, why there's not a sort of will to um, hire enough highly educated clinicians in home care. And part of it is just, um, from an outsider's point of view or from a non-clinician's point of view, part of it is that uh, you'll see in Massachusetts, 75% of our nurses are uh, unionized. And the only reason that they're, um, you know, uh, getting appreciated financially by their institution is because our, we're bargaining with them. So the union is bargaining with management to ensure that, um, you know, educated, experienced nurses and other clinicians can stay on the job. That's that has less been the case in home care. Um, Tamron and Sean are part of like a, a smaller group of sort of surging organizing in the home care uh, realm. So I think as more and more clinicians organize in home care, you, I think we will see um, hospitals and healthcare systems need to begin to appreciate that care and redistribute funds. On the federal level, that's changing. There's always that's a, an ongoing conversation around policy changes and where the funds are going. But hospitals want to, you know, if they can get something quickly, healthcare systems, if they can get it cheaply, will do it as cheaply as possible. And it's up to us to remind them that quality care isn't cheap. Okay. I think that is it for questions. 
Um, although if you want to check out, Julie wrote an answer in the chat as well, if people want to look at that. Um, and um, I didn't know if uh, Senator Paul and Mark wanted to, to say a few words before we sign off. All right. So um, because I'm on my phone, I can't see anybody. I'm so sorry. Um, so he might can, I, can I just say, I just read a question we missed. Can I answer it? Of course. Okay, because it came from my son. <laughs> so he's funny. Sorry. His question, his question was, what inspired me to organize my the union? And I, he needs some kudos because it came from him. I, he pushed me hard. Um, he started, I, I think it was 16 when I first started running into a, a lot of my trouble. And he heard me and be insistent that I can work with management and I can do it through committees and that they'll listen and that I'll be able to get it done. And he kept on for over a year telling me, I need to think about unionizing. I need to think about unionizing. You need to think about unionizing. So what inspired me to initially start talking about unionizing was my son. <laughs> That's incredible. Your name is Will, right? Yes, isn't it? His name is Will. Way to go, Will. That is so, I have, that's amazing. I did not mean to miss that question. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great uh, place uh, to wrap it up as well. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so, so folks, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, thank I, you. I've really just a few just have a few things to say. I've had um, I've had the opportunity to be at the table with Tamron and Sean and the rest of the committee, and they are a strong committee. Uh, you've seen them tonight, so it's not like it doesn't. You you see what I'm talking about? Um, they really have gone back to the table over and over and over again with so much clarity and passion, and really advocating for their patients. And I I'm just glad that I I get to witness it. Um, at this point, they really need your help. They really need the community support. Please share with family and friends, let people know what's going on. It's important that you know, you know what is going on in your community and um, where healthcare is headed. And, um, and they just need, they need all the support they can get. Um, and Alex, Allison, can I just add one more thing? You know me, I'm so bad about this. Add whatever. Just in case man, someone comes back and say, what's important too, if you hear, VNAs usually typically show a loss of money. So if you talk to someone in that realm, they'll tell you we're losing money, they can't pay us more money. But you gotta understand it's a global picture of how healthcare is reimbursed. And it's, and I don't know why Medicare and health insurance reimburses this way, but it's the way the system is set up. And it's, they reimburse the hospital, very high level, and they're based off, they're reimbursed off diagnoses and they get a certain number amount they're paid no matter this length of stay they're in the hospital. So the sooner, the sooner they can get them out of the hospital, um, which can be safer if we have a safe home care environment to discharge them to, so, to, then they can make more money and they can make a larger profit. We're gonna show a loss, but the hospital's making a higher profit. So you can't look at one without the other. So you really have to look at the picture together, but they don't ever wanna to talk to people about looking at the picture together. And if you put the picture together, it's, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship and they make their money because of us and they can pay us more and still make money. Um, so if you hear anybody start talking about how VNA is losing money and they're bleeding out money, so we, they can't do this for their clinicians, it's not the whole story. Um, so. It, 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 just know that, and I'm mm -hmm. done. I promise. No, I mean the import. You're right in putting the importance, uh, putting the money into the the staff and the um, and what you are really, really needing is incredibly important. It's directly related to uh, safe patient care. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Please, uh, I hope you already saved that link, and you're already sharing it with family and friends and sending that letter and letting the CEO, um, Darlene Waterwoods, that she needs to support the Berkshire VNA clinicians. Um, we also have a petition that's been running for a couple months. Um, I believe Joe has already put that in the chat as well. Um, I don't know if you want to do it again, Joe, really quick. 
um, if you haven't signed the the community petition, please do so and uh, share that as well. Thanks. It's in the chat now. Um, thank you so much for coming, everybody. I really appreciate you. Bye, all.